Welcome to everyone this morning as we gather once more. And we are very conscious that there are some who are meeting with us who are at home and are not able to be with us for one reason or another. And we welcome you as well and trust that wherever you are worshiping us uh, from, that as we do so through the name of Jesus, that you'll be able to be part of our worship here. Uh, if you're visiting with us, I know we've got one or two visitors, it's great to have you with us, and uh, trust that you'll enjoy being again with us here on the Lord's Day as we worship God together. Tonight, there is a, an opportunity to meet at Adelaide Baptist Church with City Mission. It's a time to hear of their work and to help pray for that work. Um, there is an online booking. I sent an email out yesterday to remind us if we want to go. I think you might still have time to be able to book yourself into a slot. That's tonight at 6.30. For those who are not in house groups tonight, that's uh, an opportunity for you to go along. Anita and I will be there. If you want a lift, get in touch with me and I'll help drive you there. Um, Next Friday, I'm going on holiday for a week, and so we're really looking forward to you having a different preacher. There's a young man coming. He's a free church minister in Esk Valley. Uh, Tom Muir, the Reverend Tom Muir, we're looking forward to Tom coming and leading us in God's Word next week. If there is um, any pastoral emergencies over that week when I'm away, then please feel free to contact Charles Amory Bear, one of our elders, and Charles will help with whatever um, is needing to be helped with at that time. Now, some of you will probably have got the magazine and read about the book that is at the back. I would really encourage us to take hold of one or preferably two of these books. They're both two books for the price of one. Um, it's a great book that takes you through lots of different little things in life that we wonder about and helps us just think about these things from a Christian perspective. And not only will it help us, but it will help those that you give a book to, one of your friends, your family members, just to be thinking about things that we ask questions about, but how we might actually begin to process that from a Christian point of view. They're at the back. Stuart will help you take hold of one of these. It's called uh, Have You Ever Wondered? And we've got a wee video just to show you something about it. Oops, something's about this. probably got friends and family members who you would love to start spiritual conversations with but you don't know where to begin 
because they say they're disinterested in religious things. They say they're apathetic or agnostic or spiritual but not religious. How do you begin those kind of conversations? Well, I am really excited that there is a brand new book from 10 of those called Have You Ever Wondered? It was written by myself and my Solas colleague Gavin Matthews with contributions from seven other authors. And this book is the perfect book for giving to those kind of friends this Easter season and beyond. It starts with the things that your friends already care about. Everything from music to justice to love to stories to film. The list goes on. And the book is designed to get them wondering a bit more deeply about the things they already care about and show them how those things actually point very naturally towards Jesus and the Christian faith. It is the perfect book to give to people as a gift this Easter season or beyond. And I pray it will make a massive difference. Have you ever wondered after church they're at the back and we'll have them for the next couple of weeks. Uh, just one last two weeks time on the 28th of this month. Uh, we're going to have a profession of faith in worship and we'll welcome one or two new members who have come into membership from other places. If that's something that you've been thinking about, if it's something that's on your own heart, then please speak with me uh, today after worship and we will uh, see how we can steer you through that process. As we gather to worship and call ourselves into this formal gathering with one another to praise God, if you're able, can I invite you to stand and we'll share together in these words from Psalm 145. I'm going to call us with the first verse and then the second verse I invite you as congregation to respond with, and then I'll third, then you fourth, and then together in the fifth verse. If you're able, and, and, and this is something that then please use these words, but don't let me press you to say anything today that is not true of what you believe. So here, let's call ourselves to worship with these words from Psalm 145. I will extol you, my God and King, and bless your name forever and ever. Great is the Lord, and greatly to be praised, and His greatness is unsearchable. On the glorious splendor of your majesty and on your wondrous works, we will meditate. We're going to sing How Great Thou Art, um, and we're going to start, Ace is going to sing a verse in Cantonese, um, and then we'll all join in with the first verse after that. So if you speak um, Cantonese, you feel free to join.
Let's bow and pray together. Oh, gracious and good Lord, we come this day to not only worship you as individuals, but as a gathering of your people as your church. And we thank you, Lord, that we can meet with one another to praise you together, to share in your grace and your love and the kindness that you hold out to us through your Son, Jesus. Lord, thank you for your mercy to us. And we pray that not only would we individually want to lift our hearts and our lips to you in praise, but also as we gather as a unity, as a congregation, as a church, that together we would be so passionate and desirous of coming as one body, as a choir, to give you that praise. To go from here in moments or Uh, later to then serve you as a body, not only individually, but as a church to your glory and to your praise. Lord, forgive us our sins. We've been singing that you didn't hold back even your Son, the Lord Jesus, but that you gave him up that we might come and know you and have the promise of eternal life. And we praise you for this, Lord. But we ask that you'd never allow us to take for granted, take lightly what it cost that life with you, that love, that friendship, that fellowship, that we would never be dismissive of the enormity of what Jesus did for us in his own perfect life, but also in his sin-bearing death. Lord, as you lay that heavily upon our hearts, may we also know the joy of that love, that grace, that mercy. May we know the joy of knowing that with Jesus we are so secure in fellowship with you. But Lord, forgive us our sins, we pray, and and also as we go into this new week, lead us with the power of your Holy Spirit to live by your law in a good and proper way that we might not only glorify you through our lives, but others might also come to be blessed as we contribute into our families, our places of work, our community with the wonderful law and the wonderful ways that are of you, the one true living God. So, Lord, we bring ourselves this day to you in worship, and we pray that in your mercy you would meet with each one of us here. We ask this in Jesus' Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to sing again. It's a song that uh, Reverend Tom Muir picked for next Sunday, but I thought in preparation for that we would sing it this week in advance. So we'll have an extended introduction, and then we'll stand and we'll sing together. It's called His Mercy is More.
Boys and girls, I've got a question for you before you head off to your groups. Here's the question for you. Are you ready? Not, it's not a difficult question. What is the name of this church? Close. Close. You got half of it. I'm not going to repeat what you said because half of it was not right. But I got, half of it's good, so you get a point for that. Close, but not quite. You get a third of a point. Okay, any other answers? Do any of you know what this church is called? Do you know? Anyone know? Do you know? Try again. Not that either. The first bit's wrong, and the second bit's not yet. Newton Mern's New Church. Okay, we're called Newton Mern's New Church. Why do you think we're called Newton Mern's New Church? Because we're the new church in Newton Mern's? Spot on. Full marks. We're the, so, in the name, it says something, doesn't it? It says, where do we meet? Newton Mern's. And what about the length of time we have been a congregation? We're new, exactly. So, it's kind of like pretty obvious. Did you know that we're going to change the name of our church? You didn't know that? Well, this is a talk for you then, because we're thinking about changing the name of our church. Now, it might be that everybody says, no, let's be called Newton Man's New Church. So, we won't change our name. But we're asking the congregation to help us pick a new name. Now, you know why we're going to try and pick a new name? Why are we going to try and pick a new name? We're not going to be new forever. That's one answer. And why else might we decide to pick a new name? There might be another new church coming. You never know. There might be. And also because we're thinking about joining a bigger group of churches and the bigger group of churches have got a name. And the bigger group of churches just now are called, one of you mentioned it actually, we call them the free church. That's the name of the big group. So we're going to join in with them. And we thought, you know what, since we're joining this bigger group of churches, maybe we should change our name from Newton Mern's new church to something else. And so we have a box that your mums and dads and grannies and grandpas are putting names into. Do you have, a, do you have an idea? A good idea? If you have a good idea, tell your granny, grandpa, mum and dad, and maybe they can write it out and put it into the box. So, right now, our name is quite a good name because, as you were saying, Sophia, we're, we're new and, and we're in Newton Merns. That's a great name, isn't it? Somebody thought very long and hard about that. <laughs> Names can be very helpful. Did you know that when the Lord gave us something to call Jesus by His Son, His name meant something. Did you know that? It's amazing. It's not just like Scott, which doesn't really mean anything. It's just kind of like a label, Scott. And so, when I hear Scott, I turn around because it's my label. But when we say Jesus, actually, God gave him that name because it means the Lord saves. Amazing. So, every time we say the name Jesus, we're actually thinking especially about Good Friday when He died for our sins, 
and also Easter Sunday when He rose from the dead. So, when you say the name Jesus, it means what? It means the Lord… Can you say this with me? It means the Lord saves. So, that's what Jesus means. And also, sometimes we call Him the Son of God, and that's because He's so special. That's because He's actually God with us. That's incredible. And sometimes we call Him, here's the last one, just today, here's the last one. Sometimes we call Him the Son of Man. Why do you think we might call Him that? If we call Him God the Son or Son of God because He is God with us, why do you think we might call Him the Son of Man? Because He was born amazing. So, he's both the Son of Man, born of Mary, but he's also the Son of God. He actually existed before he was even born. Absolutely astonishing. So, we call him Jesus because the Son of God, the Son of Man, comes to save us. Save us for a great relationship with God, and that's special. Save us for a great love from God. Save us for a great life with God. Isn't that wonderful? We're going to sing you're going to go off and hear about Jesus, but we're going to sing first. And watch for one of the expressions that's used in here, because in this song, he's going to be called the Son of God. And every time you hear something said about the name of Jesus, the name of this one that we worship, it tells us something. And one of the things we're going to hear is Son of God, which means he's God with us. And that's so special. Amazing, okay? Let's stand and we'll sing, okay? <clears throat> Let's stand together. off to your different groups. Look forward to seeing you next week back in church, back in worship. As the young folks are going to head off, Tom's going to lead us in our prayers of thanks and intercession, and then in God's Word. Bow in prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for this congregation of your people, people who love the Lord Jesus and recognize him the way the disciple Thomas did, saying, My Lord and my God. Thank you that we are able to join together safely without fear of violence and persecution to worship you, the Almighty, all knowing, all powerful, the only God the God who is love and truth and light, the God who knows our innermost thoughts and feelings, the God who sees us repeatedly failing to obey you as we know we should, and yet the God who loves us beyond measure. Lord, as we look back to the, the intensity and the beauty and the poignancy and the joy of Easter worship here and across the world, Help us worship you with a similar intensity every single day of our lives. Help us to see and feel the perfect love of the crucified, risen, ascended, victorious Christ, and help us to lay our own burdens and sorrows at the foot of the cross. In you, Lord God, we trust. But perhaps in our weakness we can at times get so wrapped up in the things of this world 
that we lose sight of you. We can make wrong choices. We can focus on wrong priorities. We can do wrong things. Help us let go, Lord. Help us let go of our worries and hand them to you, our loving Father. Help us to let go of our doubts, our fears, our anger, our desire for wealth, the approval of our fellow man. Help us let go of our pain and suffering and grief and sorrow. And help us lean fully and trustingly into your loving embrace, into the arms of the one who can, the one who cares, the one who loves and comforts, the one who strengthens and restores and heals. Help us give ourselves to you completely. All around us, Lord, we see the beauty and the wonder of your creation, the marvelous symmetry and coordination in all that exists. And we thank you that you've revealed so much to us, given us so much, loved us so much. But even as we thank you, so too we recognize that we have corrupted what you gave us. Our, our disobedience has polluted the pure. We look at a world now where mankind chooses war and greed and ambition and pride and crime, self-indulgence and a host of transgressions, and we see the awful consequences of those bad choices, of our surrender to sin. And as the tragedy of war unfolds in all its horror in many parts of the world, we pray for the victims. We pray that somehow peace will come to Israel and the Middle East to Ukraine and to Russia and to all the war zones. And for the Russia-Ukraine war in particular, where two predominantly Christian countries are fighting, we just pray, Lord, that the leaders of both church and state will reflect in Jesus' words that blessed are the peacemakers and that they will let go of their ambition, <coughs> their hubris, their desire for power, their will to win at all costs and that they will instead choose to follow Jesus' path, the path of peace and reconciliation and forgiveness and love. Lord, we bring to you those in our congregation who are suffering at this very moment, whether it be mourning the loss of a loved one, worry over their own or a loved one's health, financial worries, relationship worries, isolation, loneliness, fear or depression, or whatever their burden Lord, we pray that in your grace and mercy you would touch them, that they might feel your love alive in them, that they might turn to you and trust you, sense your nearness and your power. But also, Lord God, may each sufferer come to know the love and fellowship and support of this congregation here. Lord, make us a congregation of your people with a heart to look out for one another, to seek and recognize the sufferer in our midst and to extend the hand of fellowship, support, and Christ-like love. Lord, we pray that your will will be done in all things and that your name be praised and honored, feared and revered everywhere, now and forever. Amen. If we could turn in your Bibles now to uh, Paul's letter to the Romans, chapter 7. <clears throat> we'll be reading from verse 14, which should be appearing on the screen behind me, reading from the ESV. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am of the flesh sold under sin, for I do not understand my own actions. For I don't do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. Now, if I do what I don't want, I agree with the law that it is good. So now it's no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. For I know that nothing good dwells in me, that is, in my flesh. For I have the desire to do what's right, but not the ability to carry it out. For I don't do the good I want. But the evil I don't want is what I keep on doing. Now, if I do what I don't want, it's no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. So I find it to be a law that when I want to do right, 
evil lies close at hand. For I delight in the law of God in my inner being, but I see in my members another law waging war against the law of my mind, making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members. Wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then, I myself serve the law of God with my mind, but with my flesh I serve the law of sin. Amen. encourage you to open your Bible up again at uh, Romans chapter 7, if you have one with you. You know that we've been working our way through the book of Romans, and we've come to this passage now halfway through Romans 7. As we turn to try and work out what Paul is saying here, and with these words, let's, let's bow in prayer. Father, as we reflect on this word that you've given to us in your providence, by your inspiration through the Apostle Paul, we pray, Lord, that you would be our teacher, the one who would speak to us this day, and that it would be your voice that each one of us would hear, and that you would speak to us whatever way we need to be spoken to, Lord, as a company of your people, but also as individuals. Lord, minister in your mercy to us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I, I've given this ter- sermon a title, which is A Christian Life a struggle, and I put a question mark at the end of it, partly because I think that might be something of a surprising statement if I were just to make it a statement. And I think part of it, the reason I say that is because people like me, ministers, maybe even other Christians, might sometimes mislead us into thinking that when we become Christians, life is therefore going to simply be a life of peace and a life of tranquility. And it would be, as we have in English, the saying that we would enter into easy street, as it might be said. But chapter 7 of the book of Romans tells us something completely different. Paul, I think, is one of these wonderful Bible writers who speaks so honestly, even when what he says maybe is less palatable, less 
something that we don't want to taste, but he still says it because we need to hear it and actually, strangely enough, be encouraged by what he's saying. And the reason he gets to this point in chapter 7 of the book of Romans is because he's got to the stage where he's telling these Christians in Rome about the wonderful grace of God that's in Jesus, but he wants them to be very clear what this still means, therefore, about the the moral law of God. And so, it's this moral law of God that he wants to be very clear about with these Christians in Rome. And I think the Lord wants us to be clear about even in our generation. Maybe, if I dare say this, especially in our generation, what is the place for, especially us as Christians, for God's moral law. And one of the things that he has said already, which again is maybe something that we've we've kind of thought, what? What are you saying? And what he said previously was that the moral law of God, when we hear it, actually stirs us up to break the law. It inflames us. Strange as that sounds. It's, remember what we were saying, if somebody says to you, don't touch, what do you want to do? You want to touch. If somebody says to you, don't stand in the grass, what do you want to do? You want to go into the grass. If the Lord says, don't covet, suddenly you start finding yourself wanting the grass over there, which is much greener than the grass that you've got over here. It inflames. And so, one of the things that Paul comes to tell us then is, he says, this is like almost like bad news. And the bad news is that it exposes that we're all guilty of breaking God's law, breaking God's law. But one of the things I would just say to us we've got to really be very clear about for ourselves and for those who we might speak to who maybe are not Christians, maybe they are Christians, but that is that God's judgment of us ultimately will never be a it will never be based on what makes us feel bad. Now, what I mean by that is that sometimes you might be brought up in a family who have, which has certain characteristics, and if you do something that's not in line with that family, you might feel bad. God's not going to judge us necessarily on the basis of what makes us feel bad. Or it might be we're part of a society, and the society says, that's a terrible thing you're saying. I'm going to cancel you. And you feel bad because society says, that's not right, what you're saying. That's not what God judges us on the basis of if we feel bad. Nor will He judge us on the basis that He'll give us a pass when we don't feel bad, because there are times when societies think something is okay. Like, for example, the persecution of a group of human beings within that society that they think that's okay, and therefore they don't feel bad about it. Like, for example, it could be maybe the, the Rohingya in, uh, in uh, is it Myanmar, and the, the Ouija, uh, Uyghur Muslims in in China, persecution happens. The culture says that's okay. Well, God doesn't give us a pass because we think it's okay. Or it could be in Rome's time, Romans' time, uh, the Christians that were in Rome, it was okay to persecute the Christians. Uh, God doesn't give us a pass just because we think something's okay. Here's the point. What's bad news about this is that God's standard is so objective it's so there to be seen, it's against that which we are judged, not our feelings, good or bad. God's standard. And the problem that Paul says is everyone in in humanity, all human beings in all places, whether we're religious like Jews or whether we're not Jews, like we're either pagans or we worship other gods, all of us break this law. And it's like Paul saying that there's bad news. And it's almost though he's adding to that, it's almost like he's saying to the Christians in Rome, but let me tell you something. And then it's kind of like, is this new news to you, Christians in Rome, that this moral law is something that you cannot keep in order to win God's favor on you? Because we break the law, every one of us, then we're not fit to be reconciled to God by kind of somehow or other keeping the law enough that gets us up to God. We just can't do it. And it's almost like he's saying to them, you've got to hear this almost like it's new 
you Christians, in Rome. So, in verse, chapter 3, verse 20, he's already said, by the works of the law, no one will be justified in God's sight. That means nobody can stand before God and, and be declared righteous, because we just can't do it. And so, but what Paul then does is he lifts up their heads and says, yes, but here's the good news. This is the point of what I'm telling you. Here's the good news. There is a righteousness that is apart from the law. And he goes on to say, and it's through Jesus Christ. And this is the whole hope and life that he wants to bring out through this letter. And so he adds in chapter 6, verse 14, therefore, we're not under law, because if we're under law, that just condemns us. That cannot reconcile us to God. We're not under law for this relationship with God. We're under grace. We're under grace. When we grasp this, I don't know if you have ever felt this, but when you really grasp this and it reaches down into the bottoms of your soul and into the reaches of your heart, it really does lift your spirit to the degree like, for example, Augustus Top Lady is an old author and Christian writer, and he couldn't help himself but want to write a hymn about this because it's just so wonderful. And so, you know that great old hymn called Rock of Ages? And he had these great words. He said, realizing that the law cannot get us to God, but grace can through Jesus. He says, not the labor of my hands could fulfill thy law's demands, just can't do it. Could my zeal no respite? No. Could my tears forever flow? If I feel really, really bad about this, can I feel bad enough that this will be satisfying for God? Not a chance. All could never sin erase. Thou, you, must save and save by grace. Paul gets to this place at chapter 7 by telling us that the law is just so useless. In fact, it's worse than useless to bring us to God because actually it inflames our passions and almost makes us want to break the very thing that God wants us to do. And so he says that nobody will be declared righteous by that law. And what he says is this, and here's the thing. There's a righteousness that does come from God through Jesus, because He's the only one who has kept the law perfectly. And that perfection, He takes and He gifts to everyone who believes. And God says, okay, I see your name against the, the righteousness of Jesus, and the name is Scott. Or, or if you're a believer here today, your name is righteousness of Jesus, and then your name is there. But the problem is, being declared to have the righteousness of Jesus, the credit of Jesus' righteousness, doesn't make us righteous. It doesn't make us righteous. It doesn't mean that we're now perfect. It doesn't mean that we're now able to stop crossing God's law. It doesn't mean that we're now able to be without sin. And so, one of the things that Paul says here is he says, well, does that make the law bad then? Is the law itself like sin? And of course, he says, of course not. He says that before. My you know, like many young people in Scotland, when I was younger, I thought I was going to be a footballer. Um, I'm not sure how many other people agreed with that thought, but I certainly fancied myself to become a footballer. And, and therefore, I played football just about all the time. And I played football with some decent teams, and there were some very decent footballers who played alongside me. And in one of these teams, as we were being watched by scouts, one of the guys who played alongside me was a great fullback, and his name was Gary. But Gary was going to basically not going to play football because Gary wasn't going to do anything. And the reason Gary wasn't going to do anything was Gary had a bad, difficult upbringing. And Gary, though he was a brilliant footballer, basically was into everything that God would not want him to be into, nor society. To the point that by the time Gary was 17 and playing football with me, Gary had a child. And by not long after that, Gary had held up Scottsdale Railway Station with a shotgun. And so Gary got, as you can imagine, uh, taken, prosecuted, and the penalty for his uh, crime was inflicted upon him. Now, Gary was crazy about this, crazy mad. How could the law do this? How could he suffer such a penalty? 
And of course, in Gary's mind, the question was, you should take away this law. This is ridiculous. It's hurting me. It's stopping my life from becoming a footballer. Was the law bad? Of course not. The law was good. Law was the objective standard against which Gary's actions would be measured. And, and he failed them because of what he did. And so he suffered the penalty. The law wasn't bad. In fact, the law was good because the law actually said very clearly, you don't hold up a railway station with a shotgun. It was crystal clear. So does God's law work that way. It just so helpfully clarifies life that we can see what we do not do and, in a more positive way, what we should do. So, when Paul says, for we maintain that a person is justified by faith apart from the law of works, uh, apart from the works of the law, he says earlier in chapter 3, verse 31, therefore, do we nullify the law? Do we take it away? He says, not at all. Rather, what we do is we uphold the law. This is the law of God he's talking about, of course, because it's good. You know, when the law says to you, don't hold up a railway station with a shotgun. That's pretty good for the person who's having a shotgun put in their face behind the counter if somebody follows the law. It's pretty good for those who are paying their fares and not having them robbed by somebody who just wants to take away money because they want the money. It's pretty good because the risk of damage and, and, and ailment to the person who might get shot, even if inadvertently or accidentally, is pretty good if somebody keeps the law and says, oh, well, we're not meant to be uh, holding up a, a, a railway station. It's pretty good for the wife whose husband says, this is a good law. Not only am I not going to commit adultery, but I'm going to be committed to being faithful and honest and true. It's a good thing that the person who has something that's precious to them doesn't have to worry constantly that somebody might steal it. The law is good. And so, Paul says, no, no, we uphold the law because the law shows us how, this is the law of God, I mean, shows us how to live. It not only shows us where we go wrong, it not only condemns us for that, it not only brings that objective standard of you have crossed this line, but it actually shows us positively, here's a good way to live. Here's a good way to live. This is why Paul comes to chapter 7. There's a problem with that. And the problem is that we're not without sin yet. Sin still remains in each one of us. Sin, even though we have been saved, even though we are in relationship with God, sin still survives within us. And so, we need something to happen from within us to help us to keep this good law. And that's why, as I said in a previous week, way back in the time of Ezekiel, God says, you know what, I'm going to give you a new covenant. And when I give you that new covenant, what I'm going to do is I'm going to not only promise this, but I'm going to put something within you. It's my Holy Spirit. He is going to come within you to help you keep my covenant. And so, back in Ezekiel chapter 36, He says, I'll give you a new heart. I'll put a new spirit in you. And, well, what's this Holy Spirit going to do? Well, He's going to help you follow my decrees. He's going to help you to be careful to keep my laws. And this is what Paul, I think, is meaning when he gets to chapter 7 here in verse 6, when he says that we're not going to just now serve the law in the old way like a written code, but actually by His Spirit. We now serve in the new way of the Spirit. The Christian life, therefore, and here's a strange thing for some of us to have to contemplate, actually becomes a struggle. And it actually becomes a struggle in a way that maybe previously we didn't know, we didn't have. It's maybe only by becoming Christians that now we struggle with some things. Because previously, maybe we didn't really care that much if we told what we might call a little white lie. Maybe we didn't really care if we stole something from the government or from a company, as long as nobody personally gets hurt by it, as long as it's only the government or the company, then we might just steal because we don't really care. But then when God's heart, when God's Spirit changes our heart, and we now see 
No, God's law is good. This is a good thing. I, and not only, I want to live by this. Now suddenly it becomes a struggle because I'm, I'm tempted. And I, and I know I, I, I don't want to do this now. So I've got this new struggle. Strangely, by having peace with God. And so, the strange thing is that there is a peace with God, and you see it is because in our salvation, we really have peace with God. And this is one of the things that we've got to kind of wrestle with, is this tension between the struggle we have, but actually the reality of a true and full and real peace with God. That has been won for us through Jesus. And every time we struggle, what it does is it kind of throws us back into recognizing what grace God has for us through Jesus. Every time that we struggle like this, we, we are thrown back to realize, but you know what? I have peace with God. I have peace with God. And there is a genuine peace with God, which holds in tension this struggle every day that we might be tempted. But there is another peace that we have, and it's actually through the pressures of life. Because the closer we come to God and the nearer we walk with Him every day, we realize that even though these pressures and problems that come on us in life that we have no control over, we realize that God, who we know loves us now, has control over them. When you get your diagnosis of cancer, and that's out of your control, you suddenly realize there's a new peace to be found because the God who has loved you so much that He gave His own Son for you actually even has that under control. Even though you and I don't understand the ins and outs of the whys or the whens or the what will be happening to me or the person I love, there's a new peace to be found in the pressure and problem of life. There's a peace in the salvation that we have, but there's also a peace in that problem moment and that pressure moment when we're worried about whether we or one of our loved ones will have dementia, when we're worried about the uncertainties that come with pregnancy when we worry about our children as they grow up and how they're going to develop and where they're going to go at night and when they're staying out late and when they go to university, when we're young and we sit our exams and we're stressing about school exams or university exams or what job we're going to get, there's a peace that comes with knowing, I'm, this is out of control for me, but there's a God who loves me and He's got this under control and that brings us a peace. Or if we leave the Church of Scotland and become an independent church, and head into the free church, and we have no idea what this is going to be like, and what's going to happen to us the minute we step outside, and we've got no building, and no money, and who knows what people. There's a piece that says, yes, but God's got that in His hands. And so, Paul, in another place, talking about this kind of peace, says in, in Philippians 4, he says, you know, pray to this God, talk to this God about this, because there's a peace of God, a peace of God which surpasses all understanding, and it will guard your heart and your minds in Christ Jesus. There's this peace that comes with salvation. There's this peace that comes through all the problems of life but it holds in tension with a real struggle to live the way that the Lord wants us to live. And so, Paul says in verse 15, these words which I think sum up well the struggle. He says, I do not do what I want. I do the thing I hate. He's got this struggle going on within himself. I'm not going to put them up on the screen behind me, but just listen to these verses. If you've got a Bible, you can follow them in your Bible. But let me just run some of these tension points that Paul says here in verse 18. He says, I have the desire to do what's right, but I don't have the ability to carry it out. Verse 19, for I don't do the good I want to, but the evil I don't want to do, I keep doing. Verse 21, I find it to be a law that is a principle that when I want to do right, evil lies close at hand. For I delight in the law of God in my inner being, but I see in my members another law waging war against my, the law of my mind, taking captive me captive to sin that dwells in my members. 
it's a real struggle. Somebody in Maxwell, and I mean Maxwell, um, who didn't come with us, used to lament to me this struggle in their life. And the person in Maxwell who was lamenting to me their struggle in their life used to say, see that devil? That devil is just a terrible devil because this is this tension, the struggle that I'm feeling. And I, I, I kept saying to him, you know what, the devil's real, but forget the devil because, you know, on a day-to-day basis, you need to bother more about actually your sin nature than the devil. You, you, you really ought to be thinking about the things that you need to be putting off in your life, killing off from your life, putting off from your life, taking off like a jacket from your life. Forget the devil. You just concentrate on your own walk with the Lord and the nature that's within you that persists in trying to tempt you and trip you up to cross over God's law. Because this is, this is the struggle. Now, I have to be honest with you here and say that when some Christians through the generations have read chapter 7, there are phrases in here that they say, Paul couldn't possibly be thinking of this as a Christian. Surely he's writing about a time when he was a non-Christian, and he is basically writing about the way that non-Christians struggle with this kind of uh, crossing of God's law and so on. But I want to very quickly say to you, no, and I want to say it for a number of reasons, and some of them are, I think, very biblically appropriate here. And that is, the first thing to say is this, is that if you take these expressions in isolation, which some think mean Paul's talking about his past, you can understand why they say that. But when you take the whole movement of this passage together, I think it's very clear Paul's talking about his experience as a Christian, even as the great apostle. And the first reason is that he moves at verse 14 from speaking about I, himself, in the past tense, verse 14, into the present tense. He's speaking so clearly about his current experience. And so, when you run your eye through the verses that we read from verse 14 forwards, he was, it's all in the present tense. For I do not do what I want to do, but I do the very things I hate. And so, he goes on, if I, if I do not do the, the good I want, but the evil, I do not want it, but it keep on, I keep on doing it. It's all present tense. The second thing is that he's very positive about God's law. Non-Christian people are not that positive about God's law. They're not bothered about it. But he's positive. Verse 14, he's, it's spiritual, he calls it. That means from God. It's opposed to the, the sort of natural way of thinking and living. Verse 16, he calls it good. Verse 22, he says he delights in the law of God. He speaks very positively about it. But listen to this. Even if somebody here said to me, yes, but you know what? Paul was a Pharisee. He loved the law. He really thought highly of the law. So, he's likely to say that. But the key difference is when you look at the life of Paul and you hear what he thought of himself when he was not a Christian, what would you say? Well, he thought really highly of himself. He said he was, a, he was like a Pharisee of Pharisees. When it came to the righteousness that could come from the law, he considered himself top dog. He really viewed himself highly as a person who could keep the law. He doesn't see himself this way now. Now that the Holy Spirit's at work within his life, now that the Holy Spirit is lighting up what he's really like, he says, I see how good the law of God is, but oh, what a wretched man I am because I can't keep it. I want to keep it. I really do, but I can't do it. Can I just pause for a second here and say this? If there's anyone here who looks on Christians who speak positively about the law of God and encourage others to keep the law of God, the last thing in our minds, my mind, Paul's mind, is that we should be in some way pharisaical, that we should be in any way holier than thou. This is a struggle that we share from within the struggle. 
but the law is good, and therefore we've got to try and follow it. We've got to encourage one another to follow the law. We've got to because it's good. It's good because it's right in God's sight, but it's good because it's actually good for our neighbors. It's good for ourselves. It builds up. It brings life. It doesn't death, but it's not a kind of do this, do that, and I'm better than you type approach to life. In fact, actually, when you realize the struggle that Paul has, you realize that there'd be no more humble a man than the great apostle Paul, because he realizes just how far short he falls from that which God wants him to be. He can't keep it. He sees how he can't keep it. The fourth reason, and this is by way the less important is it not the case that this is our experience? Is this not your experience as a Christian? That you look at what God says in His law and you think, I really want to do that. I really don't want to do that. I want to be a person of integrity. I want to be a person of truth. I don't want to be a person who lies to be a person who's always discontent because I'm looking over at somebody else. They've got the exam results, and therefore I'm now wishing I was them. No, I want to be content because God has made me who I am. We want that. Is it not your experience, if you're a Christian here today, that you share in that struggle as well? I think, I think honestly, most of us would say yes. And struggle seem to get worse? The more mature that you get as a Christian, why does the struggle seem to get worse? Well, I, I think this is a wee bit like, for example, if you are walking down a dark lane and there's a kind of muddy patch in it, and you're, it's all mud. In fact, you're just walking down this dark lane, it's all mud. But it's so dark, you're not bothering where you put your steps because you're not seeing where the mud is. And you're just kind of casually carefree way walking down through this muddy lane. But as you start to get towards the end of the lane where there's a wee bit of light now coming upon you, you start to realize that actually where you've been throwing your feet has been splashing up some of this mud onto you. And as you start to get towards some of the light, you start to see the mess that you're in and you start to take off some of the, you know, the mud, the dirt. You start to want to clean it off. And then the nearer you get into that brighter light, the more you realize that even the bit of dirt that you've taken off has still left some gray strips, and that's still pretty, pretty bad as well. And then you start to see as you get nearer to the light, there's actually even not just big strips of mud, but tiny wee dots, a wee dot here, a wee dot there. A wee... And, and so the struggle, it almost seems that the more you get into the light at the end of this dark, muddy lane, the more challenging it becomes because you realize just how muddy and dirty you are. I think it's a wee bit like that for us as Christians. The closer that we walk with God and try and walk according to His law, the more we realize actually how many gray, muddy dots and even streaks, streaks of dirt there is on us. And, and it almost feels as if there's no putting the struggle away because it almost seems to get more intense. And is it not the case that when you look either through history or even at some of the people that you know who are very mature Christians, that the very people that you admire are the ones who seem to see their own failings and faults and sins most clearly. It's our experience. But coming into the light, though the struggle might intensify, is actually exactly where the Lord is to live. So, Paul is saying this not to say, ha, 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 this is a whole struggle. Why do you come and become a Christian? Because this is going to be a life of struggling. No, what Paul is saying is, come into this walk with the Lord Jesus, but he's being so clear. He wants these Christians in Rome to realize, if you're struggling to walk the way God wants you to walk, first of all, do not doubt that he's still loving you. Do not doubt for one second that He's held you in His grace, because what you did not earn, you cannot lose. What Jesus has earned for you, you can't lose even in the struggle when you trip up. But the second thing He wants definitely to do is to say, not only are you secure in God, 
But in this struggle, it is right and good because it's what God wants you to do. To walk his way. To walk his way because it glorifies him. To walk his way because it helps one another in society. But also, as he's going to say next time when we get back to it in chapter 8, you don't walk this unaided. The way that you walk this struggle is actually with the power of his spirit, the Holy Spirit. And chapter 8 is going to take us into this glorious reminder that even though the Christian life is a constant struggle, God the Holy Spirit is right within us, helping us through each of these moments of greatest temptation and struggle. And that's why Paul can say in verses 24 and 25, he gets to the end, and you see this moment of frustrated reality where he's trying to help these Christians in Rome see what their situation is like. And he gets to verse 24, and he's reflecting on himself, and he says, oh, wretched man that I am, because he sees himself as maybe you and I see ourselves so clearly when compared to this law that God gives us. Oh, wretched person that I am. And then he sees this, the fact that he's got this struggle going on within, within him, his mind and his inner being. He wants to keep God's law, but something happens to his hands and his eyes and his feet, so he never does it. And he says, who's going to rescue me from this body of death? But then he realizes immediately, oh, thanks, because he's the one who rescues him through Jesus Christ. He's the one who rescues him through Jesus Christ. Because this is a short shelf life struggle. Chapter 8, verse 23 is going to take us to a point where in the midst of the work of the Holy Spirit, Paul's going to say, do you know what? It's not just creation that groans, but we ourselves groan waiting for the redemption of our bodies. That means there is going to come a point where the struggle will be over, where the peace that we enjoy in part presently will be the whole experience. But today is a day where you've got this tension, but not a tension we walk alone. We walk it by the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. We walk it with one another. And that's exactly what Paul's doing here. He is coming alongside these, these Christians in Rome, and he's saying, you know, you're struggling. You're struggling with this. Well, let's, let's be honest and open about this. We struggle together. This is what I'm like, the great apostle Paul says. But he says, that, that's less important. What's more important is you've got the Holy Spirit himself who's renewing you, who's within you, who makes you realize son and daughter of God, even in the struggle. And it's only for a season. Who will deliver me from this body of death? Ah, oh, thanks be to God through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Do you know, strange as it might sound, it's a wonderful struggle to be involved in. And it's a struggle that we're invited into by His grace through faith in Jesus. And the outcome, the outcomes are so incredible because it means a peace with God, not only today through our relationship with Him, but even into eternity. It's a great way to struggle. Take a moment to pray as the band come forward and we sing our last song.
of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the present, powerful presence of God the Holy Spirit be your portion this day and forevermore. Amen.